Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us for the first Ben's Book Club of 2022. Uh, my name is Michael Hall, and I'm the operations manager here at Benjamin Franklin House in London, uh, Franklin's only remaining home. I'm joined tonight by Jessica Eichel, from, also from Benjamin Franklin House, um, and author uh, Patrick Scanlon. Uh, Patrick is joining us from Toronto, where he's an associate professor at the Center for Industrial Relations and Human Resources at the University of Toronto as well as research associate at the Center for History and Economics at Harvard University and the University of Cambridge. His research focuses on labor, uh, both enslaved and free, in Britain and the British Empire during the 18th and 19th century. Um, he's written two books uh, exploring the history of slavery and emancipation. His most recent, uh, Slave Empire, How Slavery Made Modern Britain, um, is the book that we'll discuss tonight. Um, I'll shortly turn over the screen to Patrick um, who will give a presentation. Uh, this will be followed by a short discussion with Jess and then audience questions. So feel free to submit questions or comments throughout the talk by using the Q&A or chat function at the bottom of your screen and we'll read them out at the end. And with that, I'll turn it over to Patrick. Great, well, thank you very much for that, for that uh, introduction and thanks very much everyone for coming. Um, there we go. Um, so in the next few minutes, I'm just going to uh, give you a sense of the overarching argument of my new book, Slave Empire, How Slavery Built Modern Britain, uh, which is a history of uh, the rise and fall of slavery uh, in the British Empire, the rise of slavery in the 18th century and its fall in the 19th century. Um, that emphasizes the connections between the empire that slavery built and the empire that anti-slavery inherited. Um, so during the, three, the nearly three centuries of the transatlantic slave trade, more than 2.3 million enslaved people disembarked in Britain's Caribbean colonies, as well as 390,000 in the 13 colonies in the United States. In 1783, of course, Britain lost its 13 colonies, but retained more than a dozen sugar producing colonies in the Caribbean. After the disruption of the war, colonists in the Caribbean resumed importing nearly everything from barrel staves to livestock from the United States and from Britain. Sugar was so profitable that one British slaveholder claimed that a single acre planted with sugar cane would yield enough sugar to buy and import five acres worth of grain. Wealth, rooted in the brutal exploitation of enslaved laborers, flowed back to Britain and built a dense web of transatlantic cultural, commercial, and ideological connections. And to give you an example, it made the McKinnon family. So William Hogarth finished this portrait um, of William and Elizabeth McKinnon in 1747. And you can see it now in the National Gallery of Ireland uh, in Dublin. Their ancestor, the ancestor of the children whom you can see on the screen, uh, Will Daniel McKinnon arrived in Antigua as the surgeon on board a merchant ship in 1688 and received a grant of land from the colonial government in 1693. He was a Scot and like many Scots, he found opportunity in the empire. In Antigua, he became a slaveholder and a sugar planter and eventually served as both an elected member of the Antigua Assembly and an appointed member of the colony's executive council. His son, William, inherited um, Daniel McKinnon's property and became wealthy enough to send his children uh, to England to be educated and then to commission a portrait from one of England's most in-demand painters, which you can see here. Despite geographic affinities and deep commercial relationships with, with the North American colonies when they were in rebellion, the Caribbean colonies remained a part of the British Empire. The white planters, like the McKinnons, who dominated the British Caribbean, had strong incentives for loyalty, incentives that you can see uh, in, in sort of artistic form here. The Navigation Acts, which governed imperial trade, guaranteed British planters a market for their sugar in Britain. And the Acts also barred often cheaper and generally higher quality sugar produced in other European plantation colonies particularly the French colony of Saint-Domingue, which was overthrown in the Haitian Revolution. But I argue in slave empire, the prosperity and expansion that slavery made possible in the British empire also helped to make anti-slavery a powerful, if inchoate, part of British culture. And you can see here something, uh, an object from the British Museum. This is a, a plate intended for use by children, uh, depicting a freed, formerly enslaved person kind of kneeling uh, in gratitude with the caption, uh, you know, it would sort of expressing his gratitude uh, to religion and to Britain uh, for freedom. Slavery was a pillar of the Atlantic empire, but empire, I argue, raised British consciousness against slavery. However, anti-slavery was imperial 
It presumed British power and it presumed British superiority. The abolition of slavery, in fact, would prove that Britain was modern, enlightened, and fit to govern its empire. And so the manor house that you can see in the background of this painting by Hogarth, that throw, throwing its shadow over the McKinnon children in a kind of allegory of the, the, the brevity of childhood, was built with the profits of colonial slavery. But it also represented the consummation of the dream of colonial slaveholders, wealth, culture, and power at home, that is to say, in Britain. So William Alexander McKinnon was the grandson and heir of the boy you can see on your screen here. In the 19th century, he served for more decades in par for more than four decades in Parliament, and he died at 86 in 1870. In his youth, he received 3,942 pounds in compensation from the British government, paid out of a 20 million pound fund raised by Parliament to compensate British slaveholders after the abolition of slavery under the terms of the 1833 Emancipation Act for the 276 enslaved people that he claimed to have owned in Antigua on an estate that he never visited, McKinnon's estate. William Alexander McKinnon lived in England and as far as I know, he never went back to Antigua. If he was typical of his class, of the well-educated, well-heeled British bourgeoisie, McKinnon might even have supported anti-slavery causes. It certainly was not unusual for people with uh, uh, investments in the economy of enslaved labor to nonetheless support anti-slavery causes. Uh, and it wasn't much of a, a cognitive dissonance either, because although slavery might have been morally wrong, uh, it was easy for slaveholders to tell themselves that it had been sanctioned for centuries, that it had anchored British power in the Atlantic, and that it supplied Britain with sugar and coffee, investors with dividends, and insurance underwriters with property to insure at high premiums. Moreover, the anti-slavery movement was not unified. This is an image from Thomas Clarkson's history of the rise, progress, and accomplishment of the abolition of the British slave trade, depicting what uh, Clarkson thought of as the many kind of little rivers and creeks of anti-slavery building to kind of a great anti-slavery ocean. Um, and it, it also sort of looks like a root system. And indeed, anti-slavery had many roots. Uh, it grew from many roots in the 18th century. Among economic theorists, the idea that enslaved labor was more expensive than wage labor became, wage labor became an axiom of imperial political economy. Among British Quakers and a growing community of evangelical Protestants, slavery, long tolerated in Christian theology, became an obstacle to orderly religious communion and to evangelism. For enlightened intellectuals interested in comparing Britain and Rome, slavery seemed culturally backward. It was an obstacle to the consolidation of imperial power, and it was a symbol of barbarism. And for Britons increasingly sensitive to torture and corporal punishment, which remember was common, uh, in public spaces in Britain for much of the 18th century, the disgusting conditions and violence endured by enslaved people became shocking and intolerable to contemplate. After the American Revolution, a new generation of British politicians hoped to tighten and centralize Britain's control over its remaining colonies. And finally, after the Haitian Revolution, the threat of a successful rebellion overthrowing slavery made the prospect of a slow managed transition to freedom appealing. So many ordinary Britons did come to reject slavery, and that was a remarkable transformation in public and popular sensibilities. However, popular anti-slavery was far from radical. It was patriotic, as you can see in this image uh, uh, by, painted by Joseph Collier in 1808 of the symbol of Britannia in the center, uh, flanked by justice and religion, stamping on the symbols of slavery with the bust of, of uh, William Wilberforce on the right of the image. Uh, and as William Cooper, who incidentally was William Wilberforce's favorite poet wrote in 1785, slaves cannot breathe in England. If their lungs receive our air, that moment they are free. That is noble and bespeaks a nation proud and jealous of the blessing. Spread it then and let it circulate through every vein of all your empire that wherever Britain's power is felt, mankind may feel her mercy too. It's important to remember that when the 1807 Slave Trade Act passed, Britain was at war with Napoleonic France. Ending the slave trade became a way gradually to reform the Caribbean colonies and to prevent a revolution like Haiti's, as well as a reason to attack and to search neutral shipping to look for enslaved people aboard. The act was a triumph for, for the anti-slavery cause, but it was also part of a popular war effort. But after 1807, anti-slavery leaders assumed that, these, that the natural, and I use inverted commas there, economic laws that they had discovered in the world would erode Caribbean slavery. Without a supply of enslaved labor, they reasoned, slaveholders would need gradually to improve living and working conditions 
on plantations until slavery gradually disappeared. And indeed, the abolition of slavery became seen as an inevitable consequence of the development of civilization in the British Empire uh, and within Britain itself. As this children's game, which is in the collections of the Victoria and Albert Museum shows. Um, if you can see the central, it's a game where you roll dice and move forward through uh, the sort of development of society, the uh, development of, of writing, of laws, of technology, and the centerpiece, the winning square or winning circle in the center is the abolition of the slave trade, which you can see uh, again, the figure of justice uh, or possibly Britannia holding a Union Jack shield and carrying an, a bill uh, abolishing slave trade. Uh, however, amelioration, the kind of gradual erosion of slavery that abolitionists imagined, did not end slavery. Colonial legislatures resisted it, and enslaved people, like, the, like rebels who fought against colonial militias and British troops in Barbados in 1816, in Demerara, later part of British Guiana in 1823, and in Jamaica in 1831-32, forced emancipation onto the parliamentary agenda. But the emancipation that Parliament granted in 1833 was not what enslaved people fought for. To anti-slavery leaders, amelioration was supposed to prevent rebellion and align the demands of enslaved people for freedom with British plans for gradual emancipation and for the preservation of the imperial sugar industry. As I show in Slave Empire, every major rebellion became a crisis for the anti-slavery movement back in Britain. I'll give you one example. In 1816, during the Barbados Rebellion that became known as Bussa's Rebellion after one of its leaders, rebels made and carried flags into battle with them. Now, none of the actual flags survived, but British soldiers made sketches of several of them uh, that had been captured during the rebels' last stand in 1816, and they're preserved in the National Archives of the United Kingdom. Uh, in the color image on the right side of the screen, Britannia sits on a lion in the bottom left corner. On the right, a ship flies the St. George's, the English St. George's Cross and the flag of the Royal Navy, uh, and you can, which is another St. George's Cross inset with the Union Jack, which you can see in the image. Three dark-skinned people stand in European clothes, two men with top hats and blue top coats, and a woman in a flowing white frock. A white red coat stands in the foreground, and four images of the crown are scattered in the field. Various mottos that you can see appear on the banners, including happiness remains forever with endeavorance, endeavorance forever, and God always saves endeavor. Now this shows very clearly, although perhaps uh, opaquely, that enslaved people had a clear politics and a clear vision of what emancipation would look like. But to anti-slavery leaders in Britain, the anti-slavery rebellion in 1816 could not have been political. It needed to be, uh, as, as the anti-slavery lobby wrote, uh, based, uh, caused by, quote, local and temporary privation of the usual quantity of food available to enslaved workers because of restrictions in trade after the War of 1812. In order to make sense to British anti-slavery ideals, the rebellion had to have been something like a large scale food riot, not an organized bid for freedom and emancipation, as these flags seem very clearly to suggest. Moreover, I, I argue in Slave Empire, patriotic support for anti-slavery marked the abolition of the slave trade in 1807, far more than the abolition of slavery in 1833. It's really surprising actually how few books have been written about 1833, the emancipation of hundreds of thousands of people in the British Empire uh, in comparison with the end of the slave trade in 1807. Uh, unlike emancipation in Haiti or em indeed emancipation in the United States of America, won through armed struggle and secured with radical constitutional settlements, the end of slavery in the British Empire had happened by act of parliament uh, and happened um, on the 1st of August, 1834, Hundreds of thousands of enslaved people in the British colonial empire were free, but most passed from slavery into apprenticeship, a period of four further years of forced labor for the same people who had once claimed to own them doing the same work on sugar plantations. Apprenticeship was designed to preserve imperial sugar, designed to preserve the connection between Britain and the Caribbean, and designed to teach freed people how to accept, save, and appropriately spend wages. Steady work and deference to authority became symbols of civilization, and that ethos was built into anti-slavery. To make former slaveholders whole, the treasury raised a fund of 20 million pounds, a substantial portion of which landed on the balance sheets of the wealthiest of the slaveholding class, people like the McKinnons, uh, uh, who, I, who I began this presentation with. Apprenticeship and compensation angered many ordinary members of the anti-slavery society, the largest advocacy group for anti-slavery causes in Britain. But the leaders of the society understood but the government might choose to withdraw anti-slavery legislation entirely unless it meant both compensation and apprenticeship were part of the final settlement. 
By this time, Thomas Fowell Buxton, who was the member of parliament uh, who had been handpicked by Wilberforce as his successor and heir in parliament, had begun to talk himself into supporting compensation. He was certain that the British public would think, would not, quote, think 20 million pounds or indeed any sum of money too great a sacrifice for the achievement of such mighty objects as these. Finally, the end of slavery in the British Empire was not the end of Britain's involvement with slavery. Despite many schemes to grow cotton with free labor in the British Empire, Britain depended on enslaved laborers in America's cotton fields. Britain imported about 800 million pounds of cotton every year by the later 1850s. You can see here uh, in this map made by Charles Joseph Minard depicting um, the, the quantities of cotton sent across uh, the Atlantic Ocean um, in, the, in 1851 and in the 1860s, you can see the, that the vast majority of cotton made in the United States went to Europe uh, and the vast majority of it went to England. Uh, and Britain imported, you know, by, by the later 1850s, the United States produced fully 77% of the cotton uh, that British industry consumed. As one delegate at the World Anti-Slavery Convention held in London in 1840 argued, a boycott of cotton grown by enslaved people would, quote, starve more than one half of the present inhabitants of this island. So that's a, a sketch of the overarching argument of, of slave empire, the, the transition from an empire built on brutal accumulation and, and imperial consolidation in the 18th century, and the transformation of that empire by the abolition of slavery in the 19th century, but also of the ways that, that that these, some of the ideas and structures and forms of exploitation that were developed in the, in the 18th century under slavery survived and were transformed in the 19th century. Um, as I argue in the book, right, the end of slavery was not the end of exploitation. The end of slavery was not the end of the empire that slavery made. So I thank you very much for coming. I'm, I'm really looking forward to your questions. Great, thank you. That was that was really interesting to hear. Um, yeah, just kind of going on the fact that you were saying that um, uh, kind of Britain's image as kind of an anti-slavery nation and um, kind of how we um, it led us to uphold a sort of more superiority over other nations. Um, how do you think this is kind of infiltrated into present day thinking and how we today view Britain's relationship to slavery as opposed to um, how we see other nations? I mean, I, I think it is a standard trope um, in the British conversation about the relationship between Britain in 2022 and Britain's imperial past, uh, that anti-slavery was the thing that distinguished the British empire from other European empires, right? So that's, that's kind of the, the, the linchpin of arguments doing the work of comparing the British empire to other empires with the end goal of making the point that either British imperialism was good um, or that at least it wasn't as bad as say Belgian imperialism or French imperialism or German imperialism. And I just think that that is a sort of uh, a, a, a very what's the word, dishonest way to think about uh, and, and uh, to, to, to try to kind of exculpate the British empire from its, its deep involvement um, in slavery and moreover, it's, it's you know, enormous, uh, destructive and exploitative empire in the 19th century, right? Like, I, I don't think that, that there's something about making that comparison that seems, you know, it's, it's, it's never intended in any kind of neutral way. It's always intended to sort of justify British imperialism. And I think that, you know, that, that runs a continuum, right? I think there are two, you know, there are, public figures in, in, in British politics for whom the abolition of slavery makes the British empire an overall net good for the world, right? And then there are historians um, who would disagree with, with that first claim um, for whom reimagining the history of the anti-slavery movement and sort of disaggregating the relationship between anti-slavery and imperialism from the history of anti-slavery is useful, right? So there's, there's one version that's kind of the jingoistic, anti-slavery proves the British Empire was good line. And then there's a more subtle line of argument where historians can sort of disaggregate what Britain did with anti-slavery from what ordinary British people felt about anti-slavery. 
Um, but one of the things I try to do in Slave Empire is to show that what ordinary people felt about anti-slavery was that it justified the British Empire, not that it was, you know, that it, you know, so I, I think that it, it does a lot of work um, for reimagining British history, especially now, right, especially after after Brexit, right, I mean, the, 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 the trope of the absent the European Union, Britain's role as an imperial, as, 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 the, as the leader of, you know, the biggest empire of the 19th century becomes much more important to reimagining what Britain is and what it ought to be. Yeah, and I think that there's quite a, um, uh, quite an interesting movement at the moment with the National Trust, I don't know if you've, you've seen about it, about our wokeness. Um, and yeah, I think it's, it's just kind of ties into that and in how people aren't necessarily kind of ready to hear um, of our connection between colonialism and, and slavery and yeah, and what these kind of properties signify. Yeah, I mean, like I, when, when we used to live, um, before I moved to Toronto, I lived in Cambridge. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember sort of going to the Cambridge Botanic Garden, which is just a beautiful, like a beautiful place and walking our, our son around when he was baby. Um, and there's a garden that it, it, a really well curated part of the Cambridge Botanic Garden that has a series of plants, you know, of empire, right? And it's kind of quite very thoughtfully presented. And it was very thoughtfully presented well before the kind of movement to uh, rethink the National Trust and rethink national heritage that shows, you know, like tobacco, indigo, different crops of rice, like different cr uh, crops from the Indian subcontinent, crops from West Africa grown in a kind of imperial garden showing, you know, that it's not, like Britain was the hub of, of a vast empire. And the idea that you can, that you can parse out what was imperial about Britain in the 19th century or Britain till the end of the British empire, or Britain after the British empire from British history is just, you know, I think it's, it's a way to try to reimagine the British past that, that where where the story of British history is not the story of the rise of the empire in the in to 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 global power from you know from 1815 until 1940. Yeah, no, definitely no, um, and um, yeah, also, also um, in your book you mention um, kind of a number of women such as Phyllis um, Wheatley who. Um, played a role in like the abolitionist movement. I was wondering, um, I think it's often unfairly portrayed as being led by white men. Um, so I was just wondering kind of what the impact of slave rebellions were and, and kind of different women that had an impact as well. Sure, um, right, so, so Phyllis Wheatley was, uh, is maybe, so there's, there's a couple of different levels um, to, to, to answering that question. Uh, the first is to consider the place of enslaved women um, and freed women of, of, of African descent, right, formerly enslaved women in anti-slavery rhetoric within Britain. Um, so Phyllis Wheatley's story is remarkable, right? So, so Phyllis Wheatley was an enslaved uh, woman uh, who was uh, in the, like the, the Wheatley family of Boston claimed to own her, right? So they were, and it was pretty clear from a young age that Phyllis Wheatley was extremely gifted um, and like just very, very, very bright. And so um, the family um, sort of gave her tutors, uh, taught her English and Latin. I mean, she, she knew English, but taught her Latin and Greek and French, like, and sort of nourished while she was still enslaved. Um, and she wrote a, a, a booklet of poems, um, which is still, you can find it on Google Books. There's multiple editions. Um, and it was published in, and they were poems about the United States, right? They were poems about the condition of slavery and the condition of um, Britain's relationship to uh, the 13 colonies. And it was published in the UK um, and then imported back to Boston. And while she was in, um, in the UK, Phyllis Wheatley was manumitted, right? But there's something about Phyllis Wheatley in particular. And then Mary Prince is another famous, is like a, a, a memoirist whose, whose book, uh, The Memoirs of Mary Prince was published in 1831. Um, which is a kind of first person narrative of an enslaved woman's past sort of um, uh, uh, like pathway through the slave empire, right? And, and eventually ending up uh, free in London. But the thing to remember about both Phyllis Wheatley and Mary Prince is that their work was produced by and edited by and consumed by an overwhelmingly sort of white liberal kind of bien pensant public, right? To think that 
particularly Mary Prince's story was presented as she said it, which you often see in, 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 in different histories of the anti-slavery movement, is to misunderstand right, the propaganda machine that was, that was the British anti-slavery movement, right? Phyllis, we, um, Mary Prince's story was filtered through, right? It, it even says in the history of Mary Prince, right? It was transcribed by an unnamed woman um, and then edited by, I forget the, the, the man's name, but it was edited by a sort of an anti-slavery publisher and then printed, right? So there are layers of interpretation and layers of editing and layers of, of uh, sort of, 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 of distance between women of African descent and the anti-slavery movement. Uh, but in terms of women who were white and sort of in the middle classes or upper middle classes in Britain, right, the anti-slavery movement was a pathway into popular politics. Um, and, and so organizations like the Birmingham uh, Ladies Anti-Slavery Society were really prominent in anti-slavery agitation. Um, and anti-slavery became a bridge into other kinds of social reform movements for women in those classes um, and, and a means of having political voice, for example, in things like the visiting movement, which was a kind of prominent British middle-class women's movement of middle-class women who would visit slums and sort of write up their experiences and try to improve, like improve the lives of, of British slum dwellers. Um, and anti-slavery was a root of that. Um, but but at the same time, like that's class. I, I think that that involvement is is class bound, right? So you we, we don't know a lot about like the anti-slavery movement in Britain's the voices that you heard were the voices of people who were fairly well to do um, and fairly well connected. Um, and so again, like the the role of women in the anti-slavery movement is complicated. It's important, but it's also mediated through the fact that it was a movement overwhelmingly dominated uh, by. And um, how, how did like the slave rebellions play into this? Did the enslaved people um, manage to drive any of their own change? Um, I, I, sorry, this is like an, un, no, I mean, no, uh, I, I think, right? Like there, there is a sense in which they did, like the rebellions in 1816 and 1823 and 1831, 32 were important because they pushed forward emancipation in Britain, right? They put it on the agenda. So British anti-slavery leaders after the abolition of the slave trade in 1807 absolutely eventually wanted slavery to be abolished, although they would sometimes deny it in public. Um, they, they certainly saw emancipation as the end goal of their movement. However, they imagined the pathway to emancipation as being very, very slow and very gradual. So in a sense, the rebellions in 1816, 23, and 31 um, forced the hands of anti-slavery leaders to kind of move forward with their program sooner than they might have liked. That said, the actual act that was passed that made emancipation happen um, in the former slave colonies or the former sugar islands was entirely made in Britain, right? And was entirely shaped by um, partly the demands of the anti-slavery movement, partly by the needs of the British government, um, to preserve the, 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 the colonies and preserve the sugar industry. And in some ways, right, like, and, and this is in some ways, like the, what happened after emancipation restricted some of the uh, ways that, that enslaved, like some of the little places of like, look, it was horrible to work on a plantation. It was brutal, brutalizing, um, incredibly exploitative, violent, but there were moments, there were spaces where enslaved people had a kind of cultural autonomy, right? Like one of the great achievements of enslaved people is to like create a culture and preserve it under conditions of like overwhelming oppression. Um, and so there were spaces like plantation grounds, uh, sorry, not plantation, provision grounds where enslaved people grew their own food um, that were, you know, maintained and informally in sort of an informal arrangement with sugar, with planters kind of left alone. Um, there were the sort of living spaces that enslaved people lived in where it was sort of, sort of understood that except under, except in a crisis or a rebellion, slaveholders wouldn't go into them, right? They were kind of, there was a tiny modicum of privacy that enslaved people had, even under conditions of overwhelming oppression. And the Emancipation Act annihilated that, right? Like one of the conditions of apprenticeship was allowing stipendiary magistrates to enter the homes of apprentices, freed people, with an aim to sort of improving their quality of life. Um, they didn't really improve their quality of life, but they did establish a precedent for 
white colonial officials like going into and regulating and micromanaging the details of freed people's lives. So, you know, I think that like the struggle for freedom and the struggle for emancipation, like look, the abolition of slavery, I'm not trying to say that the abolition of slavery was not a significant moment, right, for enslaved people, that would be absurd to say. But I think that the freedom struggle for freed people and their descendants continued after 1834 and in some ways intensified, um, you know, because I think the, the, the rhetoric of you are free was even more gall was like perhaps even more galling in comparison with the realities of you are free, but yes, you must still work on a plantation. You know you can't own land. We're going to raise the price of crown land. Yes, you have to work in the sugar economy. You know, like there were new, like freedom brought new restrictions to enslave to 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 the lives of of of, of the descendants of enslaved people. Um, and so, you know, I think like. Slave rebellions pushed the agenda forward, but they didn't make emancipation. Emancipation was imposed from without and didn't look anything like what enslaved people fought for. Mm. No, wow, that, yeah, that's really fascinating. I think, yeah, we all kind of have in our head an image of what um, kind of abolition was, but maybe it, the reality was quite different. Um, and actually talking about that, um, so this month in the US is um, Black History Month. And at the moment they are focusing on health and health and wellness. Um, mm -hmm. And I just wondered if you could speak a bit about the conditions um, that the enslaved faced. And um, uh, I know you kind of mentioned in your book how maybe like they were treated, um, uh, some of the slave owners treated them in a way, but that was not because they necessarily cared for them. It was more mm -hmm. because they wanted to kind of prolong their, their work life. Yeah, I, I mean, look, the, there, there is, it's important to, I think the important thing to remember about plantations and I think it's easy to forget, um, oddly, is that plantations were there to make money. Like that was the point, like the point of slavery, that, you know, the justifications for slavery were one of the points of origin of a very fully realized theory of race, right? That, that overwhelmingly was anti-Black. But the point of plantations initially wasn't to make anti-Black racism, it was to make money. Um, racism justified was, was a way of sort of assuaging the, con the consciences of slaveholders to say like, well, why do you claim to own human beings? And the answer, you know, in, in, the, in the 16th century was we need someone like for, for Spanish slaveholders was to, you know, in, in the, the Americas was, well, we're not going to go in the gold mine. Somebody has to. Right. And so but over time, especially in the 18th century, like the, the justifications for enslavement became more and more sophisticated. Um, but it's important to remember that on plantations, there were classes among laborers, right? The plantation was a factory uh, and a, a kind of agri, like a pseudo industrial agribusiness before there were huge factories in Britain. So before there were factories with 500 employees in the United Kingdom, in the North and the cotton factories, there were plantations with 500 workers in the Caribbean. Um, and the plantations had a really complicated and stratified structure. Um, so if you were a regular kind of laborer in a, and, 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 the, and the, the, the sort of, the, and the labor supply was dictated by the cost of purchasing the claim to own an enslaved person, right? So, you know, as the price of captives rose, you know, there's a kind of very like kind of blunt sort of ugly calculus of basic provisions and survival, right? As long as it's cheaper to purchase someone than to keep them alive, most planters relied on regular uh, sort of on, like, didn't mind if, if, if laborers died um, because they knew they could replace them, right? Um, for, 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 for less than it cost to maintain them. Um, but there was a kind of hierarchy on plantations, right? The everyday laborers in sugar fields were at the most risk because sugar plantation work was incredibly demanding and dangerous, um, especially in crop time. Um, it involved a lot of sharp implements, cutting canes. Um, it, in particular, grinding sugar required a huge amount of heat um, and also a huge amount of mechanical power. So enslaved workers commonly were burned. Um, they often worked in near total darkness. You know, there's a phrase in, in, um, in A Christmas Carol, right, by, by, by Charles Dickens, where darkness was cheap and Scrooge liked it, right? So darkness was cheap um, in the 18th century. And so, uh, and light was at night, light at night was expensive and sugar plantations ran in crop time 24 hours a day. 
So enslaved laborers would get their arms stuck in the machines. They would be brutally mutilated. A lot of, so the average age that uh, someone working in the fields died at was probably in the 20s or 30s. Um, and that was skewed by the horrific child mortality. Um, something like 50 out of 100 um, children died before their fifth birthday, uh, which is the, the, the metric used to measure child, child mortality in the, in the, uh, by, by most historians. Um, but then higher up in the plantation hierarchy, there were people like, like enslaved people did everything in the slave empire, in the slave empire. So, you know, there were skilled workers, um, carpenters, coopers, blacksmiths, farriers, right, who, um, uh, like butlers, domestic servants, who were enslaved but did skilled work, um, and who tended to live longer than workers in the, in the, in the fields. Um, and, you know, it was that fact, right, that, that, that the sort of most elite members of the enslaved labor force were, uh, like, lived sometimes earned money on the side, right? They were enslaved, but they often, you know, an enslaved cooper would do all the work for the plantation making barrels for, like as a condition of their enslavement, but would also be per, sometimes be permitted by the person who claimed to own them to also build barrels on spec for other people and just pocket the money or share the money. Um, same with rangers who carried messages back and forth between plantations, right? There were, there was a lot of the, one of the, the, the sort of perversities of slavery in the British Empire was that enslaved people were legally considered to be property, but many of them owned property, um, and, you know, and they certainly owned personal effects, and some of them had claims to land, right? It was, but that fact, right, the fact that some enslaved people, a very small minority, lived in conditions that were although they were, you know, Du Bois called slavery the ultimate degradation of man, and so even the most elite enslaved worker was still, could still be sold in a second, right? And always had a price on their head. Um, but they might live to be in their 60s and they might own, you know, like a, a bedstead and have like a fairly well-appointed place where they lived, right? And that fact was used by opponents of abolitionism in Britain to, I think, drive a wedge between black and white workers across the empire. Um, to say like, look, you know, you, factory worker in Manchester, you like 10 year old factory worker in Manchester in 1832, look at the conditions that you live in under freedom. Now, why would you support anti-slavery? Um, and so I'm, I'm always a little bit, sorry, this is a very long answer. I think it's because I've been cooped up inside. Like I haven't, uh, it's, it's, it's a condition of the pandemic, maybe that I'm speaking super elliptically. Um, but I think that there's something, it always makes me a little nervous when we start talking about like living conditions and working conditions on plantations, um, not because it's not important to study them, but because invidious comparisons between the conditions of life for wage workers and enslaved workers were a currency of opponents of the abolition of slavery in the 18th and 19th century. Mm. No, no, definitely. No, and it's, it's great. No, talk what you like. <laughs> it's, all, it's all fascinating, so. Um, but um, just obviously here at Benjamin Franklin House, we like to kind of link everything back to um, to Benjamin Franklin. Um, and we we're actually really happy to see that you mentioned Benjamin Franklin in your book, <laughs> um, because he um, actually published some of the works by early abolitionist Benjamin Lay. Mm -hmm. um, could you just kind of describe the story of Benjamin Lay? Um, oh, sure. And yeah, and alongside his fellow advocates as well. Yeah, I, look, Benjamin Lay is a fascinating figure. Um, he was a... He was a Quaker. Um, he's often described as, as like um, being like a, a little person, um, but you know, considering he clearly had, I, I think it was more likely that he he had. Um, I mean, look, it's like this called this kind of ex post facto, but he wasn't. He was quite short in stature, but honestly, not that short in stature by by eighteenth century comparisons. And his sort of physical appearance was very distinctive. Um, he had kind of very thin legs and a kind of big kind of powerful body. He had a, he affected a very long beard um, and he had been worked like many Britons uh, or many people of British descent in the colonies. He had worked in the Caribbean, uh, but had become unlike many Britons in the Caribbean, had become so disgusted with slavery that it kind of, he revolted again and he moved to Philadelphia or, to, or rather he moved to the suburbs of Philadelphia because while he lived in Pennsylvania, um, he lived in a cave or a cave-like dwelling. He became kind of a hermit um, and he became sort of famous both for, um, it, it, there's sort of a famous uh, event in his life where he went into a Quaker meeting house at their annual meeting 
um, in, in Pennsylvania and uh, hid like a, a, a bladder full of red liquid underneath his, his coat and sort of condemned slave ownership in the Quaker community and then took out a, a dagger and, stab, and like stabbed the bladder and then collapsed in the meeting house. Um, and then was kind of dragged out of the meeting house once they realized, once the other uh, worshipers realized that he was, that it was, that it was theater and that he hadn't actually killed himself. Um, and so Benjamin Lay was a very early, very radical abolitionist, right? He was in some ways a, 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 a real outlier, particularly among white abolitionists in the 1730s, uh, because he not only rejected slavery, but he believed that the end of slavery needed to be immediate and did not require any kind of long off ramp or any reason to secure the sugar industry, right? He himself never ate sugar. Um, he never drank alcohol. He was vegetarian. Like he, he did a lot of things in, um, that were, he, his, his, his lifestyle was unusual for, for the 18th century. And his book, which is a wild book, um, which you can also find, I'm sure, um, digital copies if you're interested, which is called, um, has a really long title. I think it's called All Slave Own All Slaveholders Apostates. And then it goes on and on and on. Like the title itself is about six lines long. Um, and he brought it to, and it's this, this wild text um, full of sort of biblical illusions, kind of eschatological fantasies, um, anti-slavery research, uh, reflections on, on Quakerism and the Society of Friends. And he brought it to Benjamin Franklin's printing house to be published. And, you know, he brought it in this huge, uh, this might be legend, but he uh, apocryphally, he brought a huge stack of papers to the printing house. And then like the typesetters in Franklin's house looked at it and said, like, well, where do you, like, like, where's page one, basically? And, you know, and Lay just said, just publish it, however, like, it doesn't matter. Um, because it's, it's, it's sort of like, so yeah, Lay, Lay, and Benjamin Lay is sort of somebody who was a footnote to the history of anti-slavery, but has become more important to the history of anti-slavery as I, I think sometimes, like Lay is very interesting, but I think some historians who have written about him have made too much of his significance, right? And to treat, you know, he was an outlier and it, but I don't think that like the fact that Benjamin Lay existed, I don't think allows you to impute a deep radicalism to anti-slavery among sort of even Quaker, like even the Quaker community in the 1730s and 1740s, right? I think that, that like Lay is truly an outlier um, and, you know, in some ways like, yeah, but it's a fascinating story. It's really, it's like kind of funny. Um, there's a short book about his life called Memoirs of Benjamin Lay that, that's also, you know, readily available scan. It's about 16 pages long and kind of gives a sketch of his life, his very eventful life. Oh yeah, no, I, lo I love the connection. <laughs> um, but yeah, like following on with, with Ben Franklin. So um, he was also known as quite a progressive leader later in his life for the abolition of slavery, but um, interestingly actually accepted slavery for much of his life. Um, so he, he actually owned at least seven slaves, um, two of which um, did come here to Craven Street with him. Um, but yeah, then, then later on became president of Pennsylvania Society um, for the promotion of abolition of slavery and also petitioned to Congress in 1790 to end the institution. Um, however, he there's kind of some dissonance in his thinking because he never actually um, officially kind of freed his slaves at the same time. Um, so like to our kind of 21st century perspective, that's quite a kind of um, hypocritical stance to take. And I was just wondering if there were many others um, around the same time that held these kind of contradictory views and how we can kind of understand this hypocrisy of these 18th century people. I mean, I think, I think it's, it's the, the answer is yes, right? There were many, there were many slaveholders who would on the one hand regret the existence of slavery, but on the other hand, refuse to manumit the people whom they claim to own or refuse to support causes that would lead to mass emancipation. Um, and I'm not sure, I, I sometimes wonder whether hypocrisy is the right way to think about it, right? It's, I mean, we hold, you know, we hold, uh, I mean, it's an imperfect example, but, you know, and so, you know, and it's not, I'm not making, you know, especially when you're talking about human beings held in, held in slavery, but slavery in the 18th century was not and the commodities that enslaved people produced in the 18th century and in the 19th century in the cotton era, you know, it's not, was not unlike, you know, 
the extraction of fossil fuels in the 21st century, right? It was something that many right thinking people believed was destructive um, and self contradictory and, you, you know, uh, eroding um, values, like basic human values in important ways. But at the same time, you, you know, divest, there's one thing to understand that and another thing to divest from it, right? So maybe, maybe that's always hypocritical, um, but it was certainly, you know, for it, people in the 18th century who had anything to do with commerce, right? It was impossible to separate out in, enslaved labor and its products from any kind of commerce in the Atlantic world, right? That, and that happened even for, like, even for Britons of African descent, right? So people like Ignatius Sancho, who I write about in the book, who was probably the first and only person of African descent to vote in an 18th century parliamentary election. He was a grocer in London and a musician. Um, and he sold tobacco grown in Trinidad by enslaved laborers in um, the, at, at the time Spanish Trinidad in his shop. Um, or Olauda Equiano, who's one of the most famous kind of black British figures of the 18th century, an autobiography, his autobiography, The Interesting Narrative is a very important source for understanding slavery and emancipation um, in the British empire. But Olauda Equiano was, you know, he was a ship's captain. Um, and so he carried, uh, he in fact accompanied um, an investor in a slave plantation to Central America and like carried enslaved people on a ship, you know? And on the one hand, it's just like, I'm not sure that it's, it's just, it was just part of the like slavery. And, and I think that that's one of the, so, you know, like it, it, it took a kind of, I, 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 I don't know how do I put this? Like I, in, in the book, right? I, I write a little bit about slave, uh, rebellions by enslaved people and talk about how, you know, I think everybody, just like everybody when they project themselves back into the past, um, imagines that were they to have been enslaved on a plantation, like they would be the person who started the rebellion. But in the slave empire, being the person who started the rebellion was almost certainly going to result in your gruesome, horrible death and probably the death of your entire family and maybe the destruction of everybody you know. Um, so in, in the same way, I think that most people imagine that had they been Benjamin Franklin, had they been Thomas Jefferson, had they been you know, one of the kind of American founders who were slaveholders, that they would have recognized the profound disjuncture between what was written in the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution and the reality of slavery and what became the United States. But like the, the reasons to remain invested in slavery were very hard to overcome, right? Like the whole, and, and that's one of the points I try to make in Slave Empire, right? Like the the world of global capital, right? Of global capitalism, of industrial capitalism had its roots in the stuff that enslaved people made and the money that enslaved people made for the people who claimed to own them. And turning your, turning like, and that's why anti-slavery in Britain looked the way it did, right? Turning your back on slavery and abjuring slavery required going against your own economic self-interest as a slaveholder in a way that very, very few people um, had the, were, you know, had the, had the kind of moral um, fortitude to do, yeah. No, yeah, definitely, yeah. I think, yeah, it's very easy for us in the 21st century to kind of look back in hindsight and apply our own values to um, the 18th century, but yeah, you have to recognize that. Or like not even, sorry, I, I don't want to interject, but not, like not, not even even really our, our own values, right? Like the, these guys knew slavery was wrong, or at least most of them did. Like, you know, the, the historian Walter Johnson writes a lot about uh, in his book, River of Dark Dreams, has this theory that most plantation overseers were like sociopaths. Um, I don't know if I completely, you know, you, most people who, and I think that working on a plantation made people numb, you know, and made, made like plantation overseers used to pretty brutal violence all the time to inflicting it and seeing it. Um, but, you know, it just, it was just like, it took, like we have the same values. People haven't changed that much. It's just slavery is no longer like that. That political, like that system of political economy is no longer the basic structuring institution of global commerce. But it was in the 18th century, or at least it was in the Atlantic. Um, and it was very hard to like Britain abolished the slave trade in 1807, but the slave trade continued until the 1880s, 
Britain abolished slavery in its colonies in the 1830s. Um, it still had enslaved labor in its Indian empire until the 1850s. Uh, slavery existed in Brazil until 1888. It existed in Cuba until 1876 and in the United States until 1865, right? Like it, it was a very, and in some ways, like it took bigger transformations in global political economy um, to make, and in this I'm borrowing from it, from Eric Williams in his book, Capitalism and Slavery, which is a big kind of lodestar for, for me. Um, it took big changes in the overall structure of global political economy to make anti-slavery thinkable and then to make anti-slavery actionable, to use a kind of awkward bureaucratic term. Sorry, I didn't mean to. No, no, yeah, no, definitely. Yeah, it's, it's just fascinating to kind of think about and um, yeah, definitely reflect upon as well. Um, but no, thank you so much. Um, I think it's probably time we um, hand over to our attendees to see if they have any questions. I think we've got one already come in, but um, yeah, if anyone has any questions, please, please do send them, send them through. Um, but yeah, first off, um, Jacob asks, um, where did the money come from to compensate the former slave owners in the Caribbean? Um, was it the British taxpayer or crown income or another source of income? That's a great question. Um, it was a loan. Um, the, the, after it was clear that in, in some ways, like apprenticeship, the actual labor that formerly enslaved people did after emancipation was extremely messy very in theory it was very tightly regulated in practice it was very loose there were a lot of abuse a lot of um, wage theft a lot of time theft from apprenticed workers but compensation was actually very very efficiently run in fact the the i forget the names of the commissioners of the compensation fund but they all received like gold medals for their exceptional bureaucratic work um, so co the compensation fund was raised um, the government the treasury offered um, tenders for, uh, for, for a loan um, and a bunch of banks bid. In the end, the House of Rothschild advanced the money at a very kind of rate of interest, very favorable to the government. Um, and then that debt was then, um, I mean, to use a kind of anachronistic term, that debt was kind of financialized over the course of the 19th century. It was repackaged into different other kinds of British government debt uh, from 1834 onward um, into bonds into other kinds of loans and financial instruments. Um, and I think it was only finally paid off in full in 2015 um, by the British treasury. Um, so, you know, in a sense, like in a sense, the British taxpayer paid for it, uh, but over the course of, you know, 160 years. And, you know, in some ways, like the existence of the debt was valuable both to the banks that owned a share of it and to the government that had created it, right? It, you know, in some ways, like, debt. Like Britain was one of the first governments under Pitt the Elder to realize that government debt was good um, and that being a government in debt, like it was no longer like having running a deficit could be very valuable. Um, and so, yeah, it, it was it was it was it was raised by tender. Um, yeah, someone else asked, um, how was Britain's anti-slavery um, rhetoric treated by other European countries who have, were involved in slavery themselves? Uh, that's a great question, too. Um, so it depends. Um, British anti-slavery was widely. So, you know, Britain and France and Spain were the three and Portugal were the four main European empires invested in um, in plantation crops right in the in the in the Caribbean. Um, and so in France, um, France abolished slavery before Britain did under in 1794. Uh, under the revolutionary government, um, but then Napoleon reestablished slavery in 1801, 1802, uh, which was one of the final moments that sort of marked the end of the Haitian Revolution uh, and the final breaking away of what became uh, first the Kingdom of Haiti and then the Republic of Haiti from the French Empire in 1804. Um, and so under Napoleon, like France, like, uh, so like slavery continued um, in those other empires for throughout the 19th century, well after 1834. Um, but the rhetoric of anti-slavery and the rhetoric of slowly, of the sort of gradual abolition of slavery was something that all of the, all of the empires I think involved in plantation slavery paid lip service to, um, and all saw emancipation as the eventual end goal of their empire, but were able to, in France's case, forestall emancipation until the 18, later 1840s in Spain's case until the 1870s and in 
in Brazil slash Portugal's case until the 1880s. Um, yeah, I, I mean, the abolition of the slave trade was a different kind of, is important to kind of disaggregate because Britain made interdiction of slave ships an important part of its foreign policy throughout the 19th century and signed a whole bunch of bilateral and multilateral treaties forbidding the slave trade north of the equator um, and interdicting slave ships north of the equator, which meant, of course, that you know, hundreds of thousands of enslaved people went from Angola to Brazil in the 19th century, um, even as Portugal uh, was signing anti-slave trade treaties with Britain. Um, so like in Britain, right, anti-slavery was part of a, a really complicated lattice of other kinds of foreign policy goals and diplomatic concerns and, and national um, economic concerns. Great, yeah, and then, um... Danny has asked, how did the notion of English liberty evolve over time from accepting the institution of slavery to working against it? Um, were there any outliers who consistently argued that this English liberty and slavery were always compatible? Uh, that's a great question. Um, so English liberty is not, is in some ways constrained. Um, and in, the, in one of the chapters of the book, which is sounds, sounds sort of, sounds sort of self-contradictory, but in one of the chapters of the book, I look at Robinson Crusoe. Um, right, Daniel Defoe's novel published in I think, 1717. Um, and, and, you know, and the way that Crusoe, when he's um, shipwrecked in the, in the Caribbean, uh, is able to master the land, right? He, he has a couple of books that he recovers. He tames a bunch of goats. He starts growing crops. He builds a house. He meets uh, a man who is being like cannibals are going to eat him. He frees him. Uh, rescues him, calls him Friday. Friday becomes his sort of loyal servant. He converts Friday to Christianity. Crusoe is free, right? He builds English liberty rooted in land and moreover rooted in, in mastery over land and over other people um, in, in the Caribbean, right? So English liberty itself was something. And one of the, th one of the reasons, right, that, 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 you know, it took so long for First, universal suffrage, universal manhood suffrage, and then women's suffrage. I mean, women's suffrage was, was sort of forestalled everywhere, right? In the, in, but in, in Britain in particular, was that the idea of exercising political liberty was supposed to flow from exercising mastery or authority in other spheres of life, right? To be the master of land was to be constrained by the obligations you had to your, um, to your subordinates. Uh, but also to be able to have that rootedness in order to exercise political freedom. Um, and so English liberty was always kind of rooted in, in and, and, and you know, as, as you know, one of my mentors, Linda Colley, right, wrote about in, in her book, Britons, right, it, there's always this kind of distinction between English liberty and French liberté, right, where English liberty was constrained, orderly, disciplined, based in a, a rootedness and in, in the, 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 the careful, um, restrained exercise of authority over others and over land. And French liberty was just wild licentiousness, right, and, and chaos. Um, and so like English liberty itself provided a fairly good, way of, like a fairly strong justification for continued enslavement, right? Like how could enslaved people be free if they did not themselves own land? If they did not themselves uh, were not like converts to Christianity, if they did not like have orderly households um, where men, you know, occupied public space and women occupied private space, and you know what I mean, and where units each household was a unit of production, and you know, so like English liberty itself was a powerful like it cut both ways, right? And and, and I think one thing that I mentioned in the book is that there were absentee slaveholders at the end of the 18th century in particular, right on the eve of the abolition of the slave trade, who were becoming, at least in their public utterances, kind of hostile to slavery, but who imagined that their role as slaveholders, you know, having brutally exploited enslaved people in the 18th century, now they could participate in the project of preparing enslaved people for freedom. And that, so um, like one, uh, I can't remember his name now, unfortunately, um, one prominent slaveholder who wrote, um, a, uh, Brian, Brian Edwards, right, who wrote a long history of, of British slavery and, and, uh, and published it at the end of the 18th century, like built a, a, a gravesite for himself on the plantation that he owned in the Caribbean, 
with like a, a, a an engraved, um, you know, he wanted to be buried among the people he claimed to own because he felt this kind of patrician, patriarchal uh, feeling toward them. And that, that, that paternalism was an element of British liberty too. So I actually think that British liberty wasn't, wasn't like shaped, like shaped emancipation in important ways that, that restrained what enslaved people could do after, after they, they, you know, became, after slavery ended. Yes, I think we probably have time for one more. So, um, Sam Sharp Rebellion, was there a fear that Jamaica would become another Haiti unless slavery was abolished? That's another great question. Um, yes, uh, so Samuel Sharp is an important figure in slave empire. Um, and Samuel Sharp is interesting because he, he is, he really shows the difference between a, the perspective of enslaved people for, of what freedom was and what it ought to entail and the perspective of anti-slavery leaders and missionary leaders of what abolition ought to entail. So Samuel Sharp was relative, as I said, as we discussed earlier, right in the Q&A, there was a hierarchy on plantations and Samuel Sharp was near the top of the hierarchy. So he was, he, he was enslaved, but he had been raised um, in the household of the Sharp family who owned a lot, of, who claimed to own a lot of other enslaved people and had a plantation, but Samuel Sharp was raised in the household with their children and he was a ranger. Um, so he, and he was also a Baptist deacon. So he was literate and he had a lot of autonomy to, uh, he had his own horse, right? And he could ride from plantation to plantation delivering messages, which was what the role of a ranger was, right? A ranger was an enslaved person who was trusted enough um, to go from plantation to plantation on horseback, sometimes armed, uh, which was sort of exceptional. Um, delivering messages on behalf of, of, the, of the plantation. Um, and so Samuel Sharp, and Samuel Sharp was not the only leader of the, what became known as the Baptist War, although he was one of the most important leaders. Um, but Sharp's vision of what the, of, of, you know, Sharp in some ways was, could have been cast as a kind of Toussaint Louverture-like figure. Right, in some ways, like what Sharp accomplished and his co-conspirators accomplished in 1831 was jaw-droppingly intimidating to planters and like very impressive, in that they organized a simultaneous strike by you know tens of thousands of enslaved laborers at the same time across a swath of Jamaica that was like 700 square miles, which raises the totally unknown, totally unbeknownst to basically all planters and all Baptist, white Baptist missionaries until a few days before the actual strike took place. So it was a remarkable logistical achievement that rivals some of the things that Toussaint Duverture did in Haiti. But, uh, and one of, um, one, of, one of Sharp's main demands was to set a fixed rate of wages for laborers in Jamaica that was based on what slaveholders paid to parish workhouses to rent the labor of an enslaved person for one day. So Sharp's reasoning was, this is what white people pay each other for a day's work. That's what we want, right? So this was a strike with demands with a set, with a set of wages. And that's, you know, that represents a vision of Sam Sharp and of what Sam Sharp represented that is very hard to access, right? That's only seen sort of against the grain of archival sources. But in the missionary press, Sharp was presented as being kind of a Christ-like figure. Right, um, you know, as somebody who, in some ways, like proved that missionaries and colonial officials needed to maintain control over freed people after emancipation, because Sam Sharp was like the only enslaved person who was civilized enough to not need the supervision of missionaries and colonial officials. If if, if you see what I mean, right? So there's all these um, accounts of Sharp kind of going to the scaffold when he was executed, um, saying like, "Listen to your missionaries." You know, and accounts of um, the uh, missionary Henry Blaby or Blebby, uh, who wrote a book called Death Knell of Slavery, Death Struggles of Slavery, that was published in the 1860s, right? So this is Blebby remembering things that happened to him 30 years before and reminiscing about them. And it's very sort of, um, you should probably take it with a grain of salt, but he remembers kind of visiting Sharp in prison. Did he visit to Sharp in prison? Well, we don't have the records, we don't know. Um, but his accounts of visiting Sharp in prison are all these kind of theological discussions about the importance of pacifism and the importance of gradual emancipation, right? Like Sharp in the missionary records is speaking words 
that are perfectly in line with the vision of anti-slavery and of missionary work for the gradual transformation of freed people into like British wage laborers in over a long period of time after emancipation. And it just, to me, does not reflect at all like what the, you know, what the, the revolutionary possibilities of the Baptist were. Um, so on the one hand, right, like one of the reasons why Sharp was not, like Sharp was a revolutionary leader, but one of the reasons why the Baptist war didn't become like the Haitian revolution was the Haitian revolution took place in the midst of the Napoleonic Wars, right? So there was already, there were multiple European empires that all, there was a huge uprising by enslaved people in the north of what was then Saint-Domingue, but then there, you know, the Spanish invaded across the mountains from Santo Domingo, right? Like Haiti is shared with the Dominican Republic. It was the French colony of Saint-Domingue and the Spanish colony of Santo Domingo. Like Spain invaded over the mountains into Saint-Domingue. The English, uh, the, the British sent out a massive expeditionary force to try to take the country via like an amphibious assault. Um, and that's one of the reasons why Toussaint and his commanders were able to turn a rebellion by enslaved people into a revolution. And that revolutionary potential, I think, was absolutely there in 1831, 1832, but there weren't all of those additional complicating factors that would have made it easier for a rebellion of 60,000 enslaved people in Jamaica to turn into the overthrow of the Jamaican assembly. Yeah, amazing, thank you. Um, yeah, well, thank you so much um, for your time today. It's been, um, yeah, it's been fascinating to listen to you. I'm sure um, all of our attendees will, will agree. Um, yeah, I think Michael's just coming back on to. Yeah, thank you for that. It was a great discussion, um, very interesting. Um, I wanna thank you both for hosting um, and discussing. Um, and I wanted to invite everyone um, to take a look at our website where you'll find our calendar of upcoming events. Um, to highlight in March and April, we have um, some Franklin's Young Inventors sessions um, for Key Stage 3 students ages um, 11 to 14. Um, and make sure to join us for our next Ben's Book Club in May, we'll, where we will talk with um, author Linda Coley, who came up actually today um, in conversation um, about her book, The Gun, the Ship, and the Pen, um, Constitutions and the Making of the Modern World. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining us, and we will see you in May. Thanks very much for having me. Thank you so much. Bye.